here. We run the program online with our beautiful T Space team, our program director, Irene Sacrelia, and our coordinator, Marisa SP. I would like to briefly give an introduction of T Space for our new audience. Um, T Space is a nonprofit and an initiative of Stephen Myron Hall Foundation. It focuses on arts, education, design, and ecology. T-Space programming supports the coming together of the architecture, arts, music, and poetry. In addition to the architecture residency program, which takes place once a year, T-Space produces the series of coordinated and curated events every summer called the Synthesis of the Arts. It takes place in Rhinebeck and focuses on music, poetry, art, and architecture. For more information, our new show is coming up on Saturday, July 17th by Eileen Shackett, titled Couple Of, with additional music and poetry readings. Eileen <laughs> will also be lecturing for the residency program on July 20th, and you can see the link in the chat to register. Please also see the chat for more information about visiting tea space, gallery hours, and how to schedule a tour. We would like to have you over and the doors are always open to visitors. Now about today's lecture, the lecture you joined today titled Cosmodality by Gokin Kodalik is part of the architecture residency program, a 25 day intensive program that takes place every July. Our residents are joining us from all parts of the world, Canada, Greece, Ethica, California, and Minnesota. Hello, Yahya, Theresa, Isabella, Stephen, Jingwen, and Latina. We are delighted to have you on board. I would also like to thank those supporting T-Space and our residency program. We have a great scholarship program, which we have every year and could not be more grateful for those who have offered scholarship and made it possible for our residents to join this program. This year, we are very pleased that all our residents are supported with scholarships generously provided by the Silman Scholarship, the Polymo Scholarship, the J.M. Kaplan Fund, the Mark Pilero Scholarship, the Al Held Scholarship, the 100 Mile with additional support by Elise Jaffe, Jeffrey Brown, and Stan Allen. Once again, we're very thankful and grateful for your support. We welcome other supporters as well to make this programming possible and to support architecture education. Um, you can see the links in the chat for support that we're going to post in the chat. Briefly about the structure of this webinar, I will quickly We'll go through some information about the lecture. This presentation is going to be approximately 35 minutes presented by Gokin. Thank you, Gokin, again for accepting our invitation. We're honored to have you. Oh, my, my pleasure. Um, and we have 15 minutes of Q&A led by our panelists and audience. Please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, as well as the chat function. I would encourage you to ask your questions throughout the duration of the lecture as well. Please don't wait until the end. And the theme, 2022 theme for um, the residency this year is a continuation of exploration of cosmic dust, space and time. And we are inviting the residents to experiment with design and focus on critical thinking and thought experiments through design. Now, without further ado, I would like to briefly introduce our speaker today, Gokin Kodalik. Gokin is an architect, the founder of Istanbul-based architecture office, Abud Blank, and director of design studios at Parsons School of Design, a theorist teaching philosophies of architecture, nature, and cities at Pratt Institute, and an architectural historian with a PhD from Cornell University. Gokin's work explores architectural ontology, sorry, architectural ontology and epistemology, design ecology and nature architecture continuum, spatial politics and urban commons, effective aesthetics and eminent ethics, and the heterodox Spinozis conception that architectural modalities are alive. Thank you, Gokin, again for joining us today. The floor is yours, and very much looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, Asmino. Hi there, everyone. I'm very happy to be a part of this lecture series alongside distinguished speakers. I just traveled from New York to Istanbul yesterday, and I thought giving a lecture on the cosmic dimensions of architecture 
would be the perfect antidote to fight up my jet lag, uh, if you will. So before further ado, let me share my screen and let's immediately start. Can you see my screen? Yes. No? All right. So Cosmodality will be the title. Uh, it is a, Cosmodality is the final set piece of a theoretical experimentation I have been conducting in the last uh, three years. In my illustrious partner in crime, Sanford Quinter, we just edited a multi-issue publication project at LOC, exploring alternative approaches to the interfused questions of philosophy, nature, and design. And in the last year's uh, summer issue, uh, was the first time I introduced this seemingly unfamiliar and, well, let's be honest, strange concept as the title of my special editorial section. I had the fortune of uh, presenting very interesting essays and conversations there by the likes of Ed Keller, Elizabeth Gross, and Sinford Quinter himself. And my lecture, Cosmodality, today will be an updated uh, extension, if you will, of this theoretical exploration. So I will start with a question. What if architecture is imminent to the cosmos? For centuries, we have preconceived architecture as an exclusively human affair. We have overlooked the tectonic ingenuity of the earth and world building activities of the cosmos. We have understudied space morphing capacities of myriad animals. And we have even disregarded intriguing architectural experiments of human species other than Homo sapiens. We have constrained, this means, architecture within anthropic human limits. Right? So this will be the first question I will ask. Is it possible to move beyond this deeply embedded yet parochial viewpoint and reconceive architecture from an expanded perspective? Can we trace the latent hints of a constructive continuum pervading myriad modalities of existence, including humans and animals, as well as the earth and the cosmos themselves? And there we challenge reducing architecture to a human affair and entertain the heterodox possibility that architecture is a cosmic art. I will start with the question about the cosmos itself. In the beginning was a singularity. Present day cosmogenists try to suggest that 13.8 billion years ago, all the matter and energy in our inconceivably vast cosmos are concentrated in a single infinitesimal point whose prior life still, as you know, remains open to speculation. A singularity for those of you who are not well versed in, let's say, scientific discourse is a contraction of potentiality in which the conventional laws of space-time break down as certain capacities break their finitude and tend toward the infinite. So in the singularity, at the earliest stage of the observable universe, which is deemed as t uh, equals zero, right? It is estimated that there was a combination of infinite gravitational density, infinite temperature, and infinite space-time curvature, uh, which is almost impossible to imagine, right? That is, in the beginning was infinita potentia, as Spinoza would put it, infinite potential for the self-causation and gradual construction of the universe. During the first Pycroft second, meaning one trillionth of a second of the universe, the four known fundamental forces, gravitational, electromagnetic, weak and strong interactions unfolded from this infinite potentiality of the cosmic uh, singularity, and it was followed by the rapid expansion of space and the supercooling of the extremely hot universe due to cosmic inflation. In the next billion years, now 
Remember, this is the very first billion years of the universe. Subatomic particles emerged and merged into composites, forming the first atoms and molecules. The collapsing of the clouds of hydrogen resulted in the formation of stars and gal galaxies. And the universe gradually transitioned from its dark ages to what is deemed today to be its modern structure. And 4.6 billion years ago, the gravitational collapse of a giant molecular cloud incited a relatively modest, and for us, existential stellar event, the bird uh, of our solar system. Yet a formidable epistemic problem arises at this point. How can we conceive the passing of billions, billions of years, as casually mentioned? How can we conceive this? How, how on earth can we even imagine the slow motion construction of our universe from its infinitesimal beginning to its giving birth to anything and everything, given that our only apparent access to this epic unfolding is our cold, distant, and encyclopedic narration? The short answer is we can't. Because the cosmic scale escapes us. Given our daily struggles and finite lifetimes, the time scale in which we are accustomed to think is understandably anthropic. We tend to think through our immediate temporal conventions, moments, uh, days and nights, crop cycles and seasons, at most numerically abstracted decades and centuries and a few millennia, if you will. It could be that on account of thinking only with an anthropic time scale, we have barred ourselves from conceiving architecture beyond you know, anthropic processes. Uh, maybe given our incomprehension of cosmic timescales, we cannot envision the inception of architecture beyond, uh, let's say, primitive huts built by human hands, as in the canonical spectrum of Vitruvius's and Alberti's and Logier's and Le Corbusier's, if you know your architectural history. Perhaps due to the in seeming incompatibility and difficult synchronization of anthropic and cosmic time scales, we have not been able to admit that the first constructive and space modulating activity, that is, the very inception of architecture, was the cosmos constructing itself. Right? So, this is the first strange thesis that I will put forward. This is the beginning of architecture. The scientific basis of the universe's self-construction has only recently been evidenced, yet its philosophical basis has been under construction for a long, long time. Heraclitus, as you can see here, to whom we owe the very invention of the concept cosmos. As you know, all these terms that we have been using, all these ideas, they have been invented, right? So the cosmos concept we are indebted to Heraclitus himself. He anticipated the universe's self-construction as early as two and a half millennia ago. And I'll give you a quote from Heraclitus. This cosmos, the same for all, for everything, for everybody. Neither gods nor men did create is the maker and creator of itself. And this is such a pristine and at the same time, self-explanatory quote. But there is a lot to unpack here. The same for all, it means the same for the you know, stars and the same for humans, the same for animals. There is no hierarchical distinction here. And it is not created by gods or men, but it's created itself. It is the creator of itself. Now, Heraclitus was right to intuit that the cosmos is the primordial generator of matter and energy the constructor of all stars and planets, the agitator, if you will, of each and every modification of space-time. Strange as it may sound, architecture begins with cosmic genesis, the very uh, initial uh, formation of the cosmos. The cosmos is the imminent architect of all that exists. Imminent means in life something that is not outside of what is defined. Right? So the cosmos is the imminent architect of all that exists. Now the Earth. Earth was once a mercurial orb of molten lava, 
as you know. It was formed by the creation of particles from the solar nebula 4.54 billion years ago, as its surface initially turned into magma ocean due to extreme volcanic activity and continuous bombardment of space debris. We now officially call the first half billion years of the primordial Earth the Hadean period, referring to Hades, the Greek god of the underworld to evoke the hellish conditions then prevailing on the planet. But there is another problem here as well. As biological, let alone human life, had not yet emerged on Earth in this early period, right? the question is hellish for whom and why are we playing this anachronistic drama? Might the reason be that we cannot even conceive of the Earth's self-formation? without cloaking it again under our human-centric projections and biases and you know, fears. And if we are to locate the origins of biotic life on Earth in the emergent transformations of preceding abiotic processes, abiotic meaning non-biological processes, following the consensus of contemporary scientists, don't we rather need to approach this issue from an opposite viewpoint? That is to say, from an ontogenetic perspective that focuses on how things come to be, are we not indebted to these hellish, so-called hellish conditions for our very existence? As with all modalities of life on Earth, are we humans, not the descendants of this volcanic constructivism, the children of Hadean rocks, the offspring of lava bubbling? Mm -hmm. This is the question we should ask, rather than deeming it hellish. As the Earth's surface started cooling enough to form continents and oceans over the next one and a half billion years, biological life spontaneously arose from the equally alive planetary geochemistry, developing unique capacities such as molecular self replication and the formation of cell membranes. The rest is the evolutionary history of bios, as we know it from the emergence of photosynthetic bacteria and algae like plants to billions of years later, the rise of the first mammals and even our gens homo. This means there is a genealogical continuum in the way Earth's constructive capacities have infused all planetary modes of existence with different orders of magnitude. Right? This makes Earth the builder of the geosphere, the biosphere, and the noosphere. For those of you who don't know the concept of noos, it, is, it means the mind. Right? Uh, so uh, the Earth uh, is the builder of all these different spheres. It's the shaper of all microorganic, plant, animal, and human life. It is the generative ground beneath all our cultural expressions, technical inventions, and architectural formations. So we tend to forget that we learned how to build, not in our cool as humans, but from the mountain building tectonic rifts, cave carving sculpting techniques, and plateau forming topographical gestures. That is, we learned them from the constructive capacities of the earth as such. So now, the animals, the question of the animal with respect to architecture. Animal architecture has shaped the earth for hundreds of millions of years. For those of you interested in this, Carl von Frisch and Mike Hemsel uh, are the ones to go to. And from within architecture, it is not a milieu that is well researched, but Catherine Ingraham and Carl McDonald are the theorists, contemporary theorists that you may want to check out. Think of birth powers, eight nests, termite mound, beehives, rodent barrows, spider webs, beaver dams, to name only a few. Such architectural elaborations have provided animals unique potentials for thermoregulation, ventilation and protection, sexual attraction, social communication and aesthetic intensification, niche construction, environmental alteration, and epiphylogenetic engineering of their cultural organization evolutionary feature. This means before we humans even existed, architecture 
was already practiced by diverse species of animalia. Um, they have developed our architectural skills, therefore, in continuity with the wide spectrum of animal architectural intelligence. Now, the continuity of animal and human architecture, however, is not a widely acknowledged phenomenon, but has rather been deemed a taboo, even an anathema in canonical histories and theories of architecture. Having carefully bifurcated nature and culture, we tend to ignore the vibrant continuity across uh, diverse architectural regimes and maintain that architecture is ours and ours alone. Right. I'm sure you're all familiar with this uh, gatekeeping. In order to justify our self-proclaimed exceptionalism, we hide behind ever more hierarchical duality. We render animals passive, mechanical, instinctual, incapable of constructive novelty or technical complexity or conscious intentionality or any other feature we can accentuate so as to reinforce our narcissistic belief in the misconceived supremacy of our own being, our own species, our own architectural skills over and against the rest of animal. Right? Today, no canonical architectural history survey, not even the most recent progressive, inclusive global ones that are preoccupied with the otherwise respectable task of dismantling established cultural hierarchies seems to challenge this essentialist bifurcation or dare to posit that architecture is not exclusive to humanity, that the first planetary architectural constructions are not our stone circles, ritual centers, or megalithic themes, but that there is an untold architectural history, a boundary-defying constructive continuum that cuts across animal and human, nature and culture, ecological and built environments. You will not find a course like this in the United States, in Turkey, in Europe. Hopefully we will have some soon uh, with our new understanding of these new relationships. However much we may want to dismiss architecture as a beastly dimension, okay? Now, Neanderthal, in 2016, this is very recent, a team of archaeologists reported in uh, Nature the discovery of a strange architecture deep in the Bruniquel cave in southwest France. The subterranean site contained a series of ring-shaped constructions, right? made of broken stalagmites. A series of complex operations involved in the making of these constructions, such as extracting the stalagmites, fragmenting and shaping them into calibrated speleothats, which means brick-like stalagmite modules, arranging them in annular uh, formations, okay? and uh, using intricate architectural techniques like wedging elements and stays to act as buttresses, and installing and maintaining fire at strategic locations of the structure with symbolic and ritualistic overtones, demonstrate, the archaeologists suggest, that this architecture is anthropogenic origin, human origin. Puzzlingly, however, Uranium series dating determined that these sophisticated structures were built uh, 176,500 uh, uh, years ago, then the only human population living in Europe was early Neanderthals. So we have not yet existed. We had not yet existed at this point. Homo sapiens uh, was, was not existing. Not much was known about early Neanderthal cultures until a few years ago. We have only recently cast aside what is now defined in archaeological circles as our modern human superiority complex and started acknowledging, due to increasing evidence, the sophisticated spectrum of Neanderthal cultural com uh, contributions. And I will count a few of them 
to you now. Among many of such contributions, we have now archaeological proof that Neanderthals made the first specialized bone tool, had their own burial sites and rituals, were capable of creating and controlling fire, used cooking techniques such as roasting, smoking, and boiling, wove clothes and blankets, were capable of speech and had their own languages, played musical instruments, because there was a uh, there was an artifact called DJ Pabe flute that was found in one of the uh, Neanderthal caves, and they painted cave walls and crafted ornaments from shells and bird. Um, this is very recent. This this these researchers have been done in the last five years. Mm -hmm. With the recent archaeological discovery in Brunico Cave, which is yet to be recognized by the architectural field, right, we can now add a new entry to the list of Neanderthal cultural contributions, that is, complex architectural structure. Ironically, beneath the canonical anthropocentric paradigms, asserting that architecture is solely, solely human, there is still a covert hierarchy of human species. What do I mean by this? When the architectural canon declares that architecture is explicitly human, humanity here means only our species, Homo sapiens, and never Neanderthals or Homo erectus or Homo habilis. That is, the architectural field does not even consider any human species other than our own as human. Yet, even if we are to strategically narrow our vision and focus solely on human history, architecture cannot be limited to the constructive activities of our species alone. There is a constructive continuum from the architectures of early, archaic, and extinct human species to our Neolithic settlements and ziggurats, ancient urban layouts and majestic structures of worship, even modern houses and contemporary modes of design. We did not create architecture ex nihilo, ex nihilo meaning from nothing, but advanced what was passed on to us by other human species. Architecture is not our invention, but our inheritance. Again, these are not the words we are accustomed to hear. Now, human, all too human. We, the relatively young Homo sapiens, emerged around 300,000 years ago. Following a slow burning evolutionary journey, we have transformed architecture into something hitherto inconceivable a planetary exoskeleton that provides us expanded capacities and profound spatial experiences, although preeminently at the expense of disciplining our social and ecological environments with iron grips and self-serving manipulations. There are two predominant approaches to be wary of here. Our architectural inventions can be neither deemed the result of an exceptional, hierarchically superior anthropic essence, as the human supremacists among us would like to maintain, nor can they be flattened and disregarded altogether as the human haters among us would like to profess. Glorifying and demonizing our architectural contributions, making them either the only architecture that matters or totally null and insignificant are the seemingly opposite poles of the same old moralizing fail. Right? Yet we are not doomed to this tired binary. There is a third possibility. We can affirm the mutual coexistence of our cosmic continuity and inexhaustible singularity. This can be mutually inclusive. Our constructive capacities are both continuous with the cosmos, the planet, the animal, and the extant human species, yet also singular, engendering unique architectural formations, affecting the interdependent lives of numerous social ecological modes of existence. This third position makes possible conceiving our constructive horizon as neither normatively anthropocentric 
meaning human-centric, nor reactively misanthropic. So you, we don't need to be neither nomadist nor reactive about this question. Uh, our architecture is singularly cosmic. It is cosmic, but in a singular way. Now we have arrived at the concluding section, cosmodality. Conceiving the cosmos as a constructive continuum pervading all modes of existence as a deep yet overlooked history, which can only be traced in underground modes of thinking. I will give you a very short taste of some of these uh, philosophical traditions now. Uh, in the two and a half millennial Far Eastern teachings of Lao Tzu, who was Heraclitus's contemporary, the generative flow of the cosmos, that is the concept of Tao, if, he, if any of you are familiar with Taoism, and the generative uniqueness of every being, that is the concept of Te, constitute a singular continuum, like the unifying continuity of the ocean and the distinct characters of the waves. So you have the continuity, but then all these different agitations of the, let's say, or, uh, or, uh, oceanic continuum constitute different characters, different waves, right? So you have your uniqueness, every, every wave is unique, different, Yet at the same time, you are all continuous from underneath. All right. And I will give you an uh, example uh, from Zhuang Zhi, uh, another uh, Taoist philosopher. This is what he says. Whether it be a tiny blade of grass or a mighty pillar, and you can see the contrast here is not only between the tiny and the mighty, but also the grass and the pillar. Right? One is architectural, one is the built environment, the other is the natural environment. A hideous leper or a beauteous he shish, uh, which is a legendary beautiful figure, no matter how peculiar or fantastic, through Tao, they all become one. All right. So you have all these differences, an infinity of differences, yet they also constitute a continuum. In the school of Advaita Vedanta that is based on selective teachings of the ancient Upanishads and the Indian uh, tradition, the constructive reality of the cosmos that is called Brahman, right? and the constructive subjectivity of self, every self, which is called Atman, constitute a non-duality, they overlap. So Advaita Vedanta means, Advaita means non-dual. And Vedanta means the study of the Vedas, their uh, traditional philosophical system. And I will give you another example, this time from the Upanishads. That which is the subtle substance that the whole world has as itself, that is reality, Brahman, that is self, Atman, that art Tao, meaning that is you, right? And this is a beautiful conception. So the Brahman and Atman, each and every human being, animal, and planets, they all have their own Atman, own self, distinct in unique individualities, yet they also constitute true Brahman, a continuum. In the heterodox Islamic philosophies of El Hallaj and the Arabi, the creator, uh, this concept is called Halik uh, in Islamic philosophy, and the creature, which is called Mahluk, they overlap. The generativity and actuality of existence, Vijud and Mevjud, they become one. And this concept is what then? So the Vijud and Halik and every Mevjud, every existent, they become one. Okay, And I will give you a very, very interesting example now. This is from Ibn Arabi. Look at the, this is, you need to, of course, understand the Islamic context to, to, understand, to see how dangerous this conception is because and Ibn Arabi will survive a few assassination attempts and El Hallaj, the other philosopher I'm talking about here, he was burned alive for these conceptions, okay? Uh, so this is what he says, the creator is the creature and the creature is the creator. This is in 13th century and the golden age of Islam. And this create this holy concept of holy is never used in earthly matters. It means God. Right? So the God, the creative uh, divine presence is the creature. So they are, they are one and the same thing. 
a very, very interesting conception. Now, Spinoza is the one in the early modern continental philosophy who defined the cosmos as a dynamic continuum of unremitting generativity and rendered the substantial field of infinite potentiality, uh, the creativity of the cosmos itself, immanent to each and every modality of existence. So the concept of immanence became so powerful uh, in his lifetime, and he made it do so. The concept he used in Latin is causa immanence. Right? He changed this definition from within. And I will give you a quote from his magnum opus Ethica. All individuals are alive, albeit in different gradations. The verse is credible. Such an incredible conception. So there is not even a distinction between living and non-living things. There, is, there are only different orders, different gradations of, uh, of animation, if you will. Now, this is Alfred North Whitehead. Now we have uh, come closer. This is the early 20th century, okay? Alfred North Whitehead came uh, at the, he's a contemporary of uh, Einstein. So he argued, following Spinoza, he was very, very influenced by Spinoza. He argued that the cosmos is indeed fueled by a constructive principle he called the creative advance, okay? So the creativity is inherent to each actual entity. And this creativity is the very motor, the dynamo, uh, the fuel, if you will, uh, of cosmic presence. And I will give you a quote from him. Creativity is the ultimate principle by which the many, which are the universe disjunctively, become the one actual occasion, which is the universe conjunctively. Now, philosophers, of course, use these very sophisticated terms. The universe disjunctively means it, it becomes many, all these different ways, all these different, you know, diversity of different beings in the universe. But at the same time, that creativity um, this constitutes a singular continuum, as we discussed in the previous philosophical traditions. The creative advance is the application of this ultimate principle of creativity to each novel situation. The world is self-creative. Every actual entity is self-creating creature. Right. Just look at the look at the resonances with what Ibn Arabi already said. Every creature is already self-creating and creative. Right? Now, finally, Laszlo Mahali Naj, I want to introduce, of course, a figure from architecture and art. It is very hard to find, but uh, I have my favorite. Uh, he, in a criminally, criminally overlooked essay preceding his Bauhaus years, uh, titled Dynamic Constructive Systems of Forces, he developed an original cosmology based on the principle of vital constructivity. Okay. This is his concept, vital constructivity. In German, it is die vitale constructivität. Uh, this is the quote that I will give from him. Vital constructivity is the embodiment of life and the principle of all human and cosmic unfoldings. So every human or cosmic unfolding unfolds with each and every act this vital constructivity, this, this principle that he talks about. Now, I will give a much longer quote so that you can understand this because it might, it might still be registered as very abstract. So here, here is what he's saying, okay? Translated into art and architecture today, this means the activation of space by means of dynamic constructive systems of forces, dynamic constructive systems of forces, we must therefore replace the static principle of classic art with the dynamic principle of cosmic life. Now you understand what this means after everything I have been unpacking for you. Stated practically, instead of static material construction, material and form relations, dynamic construction, vital construction and force relations must be evolved in which the material is employed only as the carrier of forces, which means you're not applying the matter and form superficially, only as an apparent, right, uh, cosmetic 
uh, let's say gesture, but you are sculpting matter and form as the carrier of the forces. Which forces? The forces of cosmic life that are already inherent in anything and everything. This means man experiences a heightening of his own faculties and becomes an active partner with the cosmic forces unfolding themselves. This last sentence is this ethical aesthetic uh, stance of Mahalinaj. You are to become an active partner, not a passive partner, an active partner with the cosmic forces unfolding themselves, where you become one with the universe. Uh, with your uh, architectural and aesthetic production. This is such an incredible, uh, such an incredible paragraph. Now, at the end of this very short and brief, but nevertheless important, let's say, uh, genealogical tracing, this is my question. Can't we today form a novel alliance with these underground modalities of philosophy and architecture that span across thousands of years and diverse cultural geographies ranging from Europe and America to Middle and Far East. There we take this heterodox lineage of philosophical speculations even further and identify this ontogenetic act, this generative capacity this constructive continuum of the cosmos with architecture as such. That is my question. It's a very, very difficult question to ask ourselves. Can we redefine architecture as the very constructive continuum of the cosmos? Now, redefining architecture as the sculpting of constructive capacities immanent through the very flesh of cosmic existence. So this is our new definition right now. I will read it again. The sculpting of constructive capacities immanent through the very flesh of cosmic existence. If you redefine architecture like this, it means we need to get out of our comfort zone, defy our deeply entrenched anthropocentric presuppositions and expand architecture's horizon from the current cultural and very narrow boundaries to cosmic extends, right? This means conceiving architecture beyond both fashionable trends and established conservative canons. This new sense of perspective can lead to a triadic tripartite uh, world building, interfusing the cosmos, the potential reach of design and our human, all to human contingencies. Novel experiments can emerge from this reorientation, making architecture a dynamic nexus, animating not just buildings, cities, and social political formations, if you will, but also biotic communities, planetary forces, and galactic potentials. In the end, the heterodox approach is a provocation to comparatively redefine the being of architecture and the architecture of being. So the being of architecture means architecture's being itself, architecture's own existential, uh, let's say, processes, right? And the architecture of being means the very architectural system behind the existence as such. So you have both an architectural question and a philosophical question. How can we comparatively, let's say, redefine both? A call for reading symbiotic meshes across dimensions seemingly alien, yet latently coextensive with our reality. An invitation to tap into the imminent dance of each and every modality of existence, but the constructive continuum of the cosmos itself, that is cosmodel. And that's the end of my lecture. And I'm looking forward to your question. Thank you so much, Gokin, for your wonderful lecture. It was very inspiring, so much to take <laughs> and uh, to think about. Um, it, it was an amazing lecture. I would like to open our, um, Stephen is with us. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, I'm, I, I'm very inspired by that talk. It was almost as if uh, 
that could have been the uh, leading talk for launching our studio. We're doing an experimental <laughs> studio, and and uh, I'm well, I'm pretty close to Sanford Quinter, so some of these yeah. floating <laughs> ideas. Uh, I think the question, you know, for the students having mm -hmm. to do something in three weeks. How does it take some kind of form? And I think the mm -hmm. one inspirational image was the light and space modulator of modulator. So I would suggest that all of the students look deeply and see what you can find out about it. It's a fantastic piece of work uh, with a lot of implications. And uh, I think it's uh, suggestive of some of those thoughts. But I, you know, and I, I, my good friend, Johanny Palosma, wrote a book on animal architecture. I wish you would include that in here. Uh -huh. It was a very important, in fact, it was an exhibition in Helsinki. And mm -hmm. it, I think it comes before almost all the other examples that you put. And I think his, you know, let's say, phenomenological questions in that mm -hmm. book are pretty important. But I'm, I'm not sure how that translates for these students and I would only have one one question. I'd like to throw the whole beginning of your talk into question. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the problems I have with the Big Bang Theory is mm -hmm. it doesn't question anything. Mm -hmm. So for the longest period of time, I question the Big Bang Theory itself. And right now there's five different alternatives. There's mm -hmm. the steady state model, which means no beginning, no end which I always like, you know, I think one of the reasons we scientists come up with a big bang theory is they can't imagine no beginning and no end infinity. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the steady state model. There's the bouncing cosmological model. There's the black hole origin theory. There's the plasma or electric universe theory. Then there's the simulation theory. Anyway, there's a number of theories that are alternate to the big mm -hmm. bang and I think you take that so for granted in the beginning of your talk. I, I love all the rest of the talk, but I'd like to give mm -hmm. you and you, and I also like the way you present, calling things into question. I'd like to call into question the whole beginning mm -hmm. of your, your talk and say, let's, let's assume there are alternatives to the Big Bang Theory. By the mm -hmm. way, when we got the image from the Hubble uh, of the galaxies, that's when people who we're speaking about the steady state theory started to have a little ammunition and we're just ready. And in fact, tomorrow to get the web telescope, the first web telescope images, which are going to be much deeper in space than the Hubble. I think we're going to see some fascinating things. And uh, I, I predict that the big bang theory won't hold in another 10 years. Anyway, I, I love your talk and let's have some students ask questions I'm, I'm dominating too much here <laughs> mm -hmm. let me just give a short comment before the students interject yeah i mean the reason i left that part open is if you remember i said the the, the prior uh, part of the big bang theory is still op open to speculation right so there is there is a there is a prior condition to that, and we are still trying to understand what that is. Yet, I mean, in the philosophies that I have been unpacking here, for instance, in Heraclitus and in Spinoza, the steady state model sounds very static. But uh, the conception of an infinite, uh, let's say, uh, infinite differentiation that goes on for what is deemed to be eternity is a very, very interesting one. And they both, they both subscribe to that. And I even remember the Heraclitus, he has a very beautiful, very beautiful quote about this. Let me try to remember it from the top of my head. He says, the cosmos is an everlasting fire, kindling in measures and going out in measures. So it is, so the conception is not that it is steady or steady, but it is this fire. It is always dynamic, but that dynamism itself is eternal, right? Uh, which I have always conceived to be a very beautiful. And, and yeah, I agree with that. Uh, the only fact that the scientific right now discoveries right now are giving us the big bang you know, theory. So it's, it's safe to bracket uh, the question, every other question, and start from there. 
we can, if we go on and talk about that eternal uh, conception of the universe, then this constructive continuum that I have been talking about from the cosmos to the earth to, to the humans, then it becomes even more interesting, right? So it becomes this constructive continuum uh, does not even, uh, let's say, it is, uh, it is an eternally, uh, eternally constructed, always changing, always uh, modifying itself. But yeah, let's hear from the student. And I just want to say for the students that sometimes when I give these lectures, they sound because of the philosophical, let's say, uh, elaborations. Uh, I see that some of you find it hard to break the ice. Right? But once one of you, one, one brave soul comes forward, then we start talking and talking. So no pressure. But uh, let's see who will who will break the ice first. Gokhan, I can ask a question. Thank you yes, so much please. for your wonderful talk. Um, one thing that um, I think you uh, spent a little bit of time on in the middle of your talk was this idea that um, there's some certain lenses that prevent us from looking back and thinking about um, activities that go on outside of our definition of human activities. Um, do you see that awareness changing at all? Do you think that that is just so baked into how we operate that we will never change that awareness? Do you know what I mean? To what degree do you think that's really coded within us? Right, right. No, that's a great question. <clears throat> well, um, one of the one of the philosophical traditions and very canonical on the Kantian tradition, I'm sure you all know, the Immanuel Kant. For him, space and time, the way we think about it, are uh, inescapable. Right. So he has a concept of numen or being on sich, the thing in itself, the reality as such, we can never access it because of our uh, limits, limited conceptions, limited, uh, let's say, apprehensions of time and space. But there are other philosophical traditions and all the ones that I have been unpacking for you, this, uh, this uh, subterranean lineage of thinkers, these underground thinkers, they have all been talking about how to access that, how to tap into that. Not in its absolute, let's say, extent, you're not tapping into everything and anything at once, but you're uh, accessing into, uh, let's say, as many dimensions as possible. You're trying to unlock yourself. Uh, in, and, and to do that, you, you need to find that. You need to find your commonality. Just like, for instance, right now, I'm speaking a certain language and you also know the language, hence you understand what I'm saying. If not, you would not, right? So how to find that language, right? Beyond the anthropic, how to understand other forms of temporalities beyond the human. So if you do not spend time trying to understand the animals, the Neanderthal, the earth itself, the cosmos itself, and then you'll always be exposed to you know, social conventions, right? So it will be very hard to break that. So it is a question of uh, effort uh, on one hand. And whether there is a certain uh, change of, let's say, change of behavior in the last years, um, that's a difficult question because for that, I need to be aware of a lot of things, right? Uh, in architecture, uh, not that much. In humanities, uh, there are certain there are certain modes of thinking that are trying to extend themselves towards the animals and the plants and the, you know non living things. So there are certain potentials there. But still, uh, my point about giving you that continuity right, uh, from Heraclitus and Taoism up until today is to make sure, I mean, the, what is predominant, what is canonical, what is underground is less important for you. What is important, I think, for you is that there are instances at every period of human history, 
right? So it is not a contemporary phenomenon. It is not a modern phenomenon, but it's also not an archaic phenomenon that we are leaving behind. It is not like, you know, the sh shamanic animist conception of the universe. Now that we have science, we can leave it behind. There is a continuity across those understandings as well, just as there is a continuity in the canonical conceptions in architecture and philosophy. And the canonical conceptions have all been up until now on the side of thinking only about human interests, only looking at things from our own perspective, and understand it, right? But still, uh, my point is, there is so much to gain if we can really expand uh, our, our, our perspective and understand that it, they are not mutually exclusive, right? You can still uh, invest in your, you know, uh, our own flourishing, yet at the same time, not at the expense of, at the same time, the flourishing of everything you have. That's the, that's the ethical, let's say, outcome. Thank you, Gokhan. Thank you for putting together such a um, challenging but very clearly made presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Anyone else? I wanted to add, thank you, first of all, um, uh, Stephen and I have been thinking a lot about the work of E.O. Wilson, the biologist, mm -hmm. and right. uh, his books uh, were one, The Half Earth, and mm -hmm. uh, also the other one, Origins of Creativity. And mm -hmm. maybe that is a figure that's also trying to transverse that kind of area yes. of kind of biology uh, to mm -hmm. um, a larger understanding of uh, the condition of uh, humanity. And uh, I think especially mm -hmm. his concept, the half earth, I think it speaks of preserving half of our, of our planet for the kind of wilderness and uh, that not being really a duality, but rather understanding that continuum, the way the way you you speak about that, mm -hmm. um, and maybe uh, and the oceanic, uh, he also speaks of the, the way you mentioned uh, that continuum. Uh, maybe there is a way where we could enrich because you you are drawn from from philosophy, and that's also a very big opening up for architects, mm -hmm. maybe biology, maybe other fields. And so what would be your kind of ideal situation of how you can bring all these forces together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, just to keep the talk uh, short, I, I try to limit myself to very selective, uh, you know, uh, stations. But yeah, E.O. Wilson, we are teaching E.O. Wilson and, and at Kraft at Sanford, right? Uh, as part of our class. Yeah, in biology and science, you can find, I mean, Einstein himself says, I mean, I only believe in Spinoza's God. Uh, by that he means, as you know, Spinoza's famous, infamous, uh, perhaps, conception that God or nature. So God is nature itself in its creative dimension. So E.O. Wilson, uh, in the history of biology, you also have this uh, two different uh, tendencies. On the one hand, you have very canonical tendencies, but the lineage, for example, the hierarchies are very, uh, the very the, the so-called founder of modern biology. Right? The hierarchies are very, very strict. The human, the animals, the plants, and the minerals, etc. And then with Darwin, you have this continuity within the living, let's say, uh, system. All of a sudden, humans and animals and apes, we all start to constitute this continuity. And there are many interesting uh, stations in between those as well, at Buffon and uh, even in the late uh, 20th century, you have Ernst Meyer, uh, the population, uh, uh, the population thinking in biology. Yeah, I mean we can do this in every in, in every field, in physics. Uh, uh, for instance, in one of my other talks, I my critique, I have a critique of uh, of some of the latest uh, models, uh, cosmological models, in which including Stephen Hawking, in which they deem the universe has an, as what they call an anthropic principle. So they believe the universe existed for us to emerge, right? The entire history of the universe. So think about the, think about the arrogance, right? 
So the thelos, the very meaning, the very end of this universe is just to create us, the human beings, right? The, it is called the anthropic principle, if you're interested. Uh, so that kind of thinking is very common, very mainstream. Most of the people that, I mean, because we are not physicists, right? The, the physicists that we know are those popular scientists, as it were. Most of them, you, you, would be, you would be very scared to learn what kind of an anthropocentric lens they uh, project uh, onto the understanding of the cosmos. Yet at the other end, as I show, there are all these beautiful, less known and uh, overlooked sometimes uh, figures we should uh, pay more attention. And one more, uh, just uh, so how would you expand a little more on your view of the oceanic? Uh, what do you mean? The, you mentioned in your talk that kind of transition of one state to another and that they all mm -hmm. exist in, the, in a continuum. And I, I forget now um, under which historical uh, moment you brought it in, um, but is there something beyond uh, th th the word oceanic as a metaphor, maybe, or as a kind of broader? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a metaphor used in, in this uh, in this lineage of philosophies and modes of thinking. Uh, uh, the ocean is a metaphor that is used a lot in Islamic philosophy as well. It has a very, very ancient history. Because if you think it is an incredibly powerful metaphor, because if you think about it, it is about how you can conceive something that has two dimensions, but those two dimensions are already in and existing and happening at the same time. If you look at the ocean from the bottom of it, you will see a single block of continuity. You would not be able to even perhaps see uh, the waves, right? If you look at from the top, you would see what you will see it will only be the extrusions of these different, you know, waves. And if you focus too much on the waves, you may even, you know, lose the continuity itself. But if you can have both visions at once and understand that this ocean and the waves are one and the same thing, yet at the same time, they display both the continuity, but also all these unique moments because no wave is the same as the next thing, right? Although of course, with our, again, human minds, we see them to be very similar, but all of them occupy a different space time, they have different heights, different velocities, different relationship with the wind, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, as architects, you would not be very interested perhaps in that, but if you are a surfer, for instance, right? You would know all the minute differences of this way from that way, right? And how you can channel that, how you can become part of it, how you can channel it in such a way that your body can also, uh, let's say, at certain moments become one with that wave and at certain moments become one with the, let's say, ocean itself. So it's a very, I think, beautiful uh, metaphor to understand those and two also dimensions. And on different states of uh, being, the, uh, uh, the particles in the air and the rain coming back to it and water being part of us, really, kind right. of, uh, the trace of life, I, I kind of find, it goes a little bit beyond the more uh, typical architectural reading, but as a metaphor for the continuum, I think it's a, a beautiful right. one, also in the Buddhist, Buddhist readings. And yes, yes. Anyone else? Uh, I think I have a question. Uh, yeah. Albeit it may be a quite mundane one, but I'm just curious about like I think there is a kind of like a gap between like acknowledging and embracing the philosophy of the architecture as the sculpting of the constructive capacities eminent to the uh, the cosmic the, the cosmic existence as you mentioned, but I think that um, maybe incorporating this kind of philosophy into our practice it might be quite another thing because uh, you speak of like humans becoming active uh, participators in, in the universal constructive continuum and eventually like raising our capacities uh, and faculties. Uh, but I don't think it's kind of like doable just by acknowledging that architecture is a cosmic uh, entity and, and a cosmic procedure. So what are some other things that we should do as architects? What are some other tasks that should be added to our agenda to eventually reach this goal. Right, no, that's a beautiful observation. Uh, this, 
this lecture is on what is conventionally deemed in philosophy as ontology and epistemology, meaning the question of being and knowing. How can we know something and what is uh, being, right? So the question that you're asking, what can we do with that as architects? And architects always ask this question because, you know, we are practical beings. We need to find those cosmic, let's say, flows, but then we need to put them into use. And the question is how, right? But that is an ethical and aesthetic question meaning it is not about acknowledging something, it is not about understanding something, it is not about what is out there, it is about what you do with your understanding, how you can you know, shape, how you can surf those cosmic undercurrents, right? And that question is up to you, right? I don't like talking about it because I, you know, I, I have my own lectures on ethics and aesthetics as well, and different modes of understanding ethics trying to move away from certain pitfalls right, in, a, in architectural approaches. But in the end, as an architect, that is how you, how it, what uh, you, you, as an architect, this is what defines you. Once you come across these interesting, let's say ideas, if you find it interesting, then the first question, is, okay, I have this understanding of the cosmos and the earth and the animals and even Neanderthals now, what am I gonna do with this, okay? Will I move on and do nothing with it? Or can I take some of these things, combine it with all my current, let's say, baggage, that my own interests, I'm interested in science fiction, I'm interested in the light, I'm interested in philosophy of phenomenology, I'm interested in, say, uh, material experimentations with wood, what have you. All of you, each one and every one of you have put have different dispositions, right? Then how can you bring that with that? And that is your that is that is your task, and that is the task of your studio. I, I would presume. How can you take these? Okay. Uh, so this is what I can give you, and what you can take from it is up to you. All right, Jinju. Yeah, thank you so much. That's very thought provoking. Thank you. I have a question, if you don't mind. Uh, thank you for this great talk. It was quite um. Uh, it makes you kind of reflect on a lot of a lot of questions. Um, I wanted to speak to a few things. Um, you, you, we we find that there's this kind of universal fingerprint that we find, or universal fingerprints that we find in the natural world we observe, and we kind of I guess we distill them through various like ratios, like the golden ratio, and how we observe some of these natural elements. Uh, then you also mm -hmm. spoke about the Neanderthals and these circular forms that. That, that, that were found recently. And um, I guess this is even maybe symbolic to the layering of movements throughout the cosmos, this kind of uh, circular uh, motion uh, and the new sphere, which I found quite interesting, um, which I guess talks about consciousness and perhaps our origin of consciousness coming or, or connected to the universe itself. And these relationships being of like of one rather than kind of existing mm -hmm. simultaneously. Um, I've been so I've been interested in this dichotomy between architectural archetypes, which are perhaps more contaminated by by our like self self referential mm -hmm. course of history, and we're kind of bound by the things that we adopt previously, and that's I guess the nature mm -hmm. of the timeline. Um, mm -hmm. But also the, the comparison to maybe universal archetypes, which are mm -hmm. I guess conversations on origin on a I guess a larger scale and even like just the I guess the conversation of the studio or this uh, residency speaks beyond architectural history let's say um, mm -hmm. so I guess the question is if we're connected to the universe on on a very deep level uh, as he spoke mm -hmm. I mean it's 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 more uh, open ended but are there innate meanings to form or are there ways to discover innate meanings to form mm -hmm. because i mean we we are we do see that human beings are quite concerned or interested in in meaning behind geometry otherwise i mean we wouldn't perhaps be having these conversations or the neanderthals perhaps wouldn't be um maybe demonstrating these these forms so i just i, just, I guess it's that it's it's this meaning behind geometry. Um, yeah, if you can speak to that, that would be quite interesting and great. Okay. Yeah, it's a very tough question, Yahya. 
Um, the reason being, I mean, the archetype is a different question. The form is a different question, and the meaning is absolutely a different question. But let me try to bring all of them together. Now, one thing I like about the archetype concepts, not necessarily in architecture, but <clears throat> perhaps, for, for instance, in psychology, in Jung, is that it always brings you into this dilemma of thinking about uh, uh, the continuity of something that existed at the very beginning and what you're doing right now. Right? So it always forces you into a genealogical reading of this gap between those two things. But uh, the way that it is used, especially in, arch in architecture, the, the question of type, uh, the question of archetypes, uh, has always been uh, in a way to freeze, let's say, a certain form, right? And in a way to promote as though it is the correct and self, uh, uh, let's say, uh, self-referential one. Right? So it is as though the architect who believes a certain form and the taste of the architect depends where it changes from one to the other. But whoever has a certain taste, you are trying to impose that form back into the history of the humankind or what have you. And then retroactively trying to uh, trying to argue that that has always been. that is also the question of the primitive heart. If you look at the primitive hut with Logier, Logier wants to see the primitive hut in the style that he likes architecture to be. If you look at Le Corbusier's primitive hut, it is a geometrical, you know, rectangle, pristine, and very basic. And he says that you see my modern architecture, you can even see it in the very primitive hut because it's eternally true, right? So there's that danger in freezing, in, in thinking about form as a static never changing, once and for all correct, uh, you know, uh, mode of, uh, let's say, uh, relating to your environment. The conceptions that I'm more interested in, uh, which goes back to Stephen's question and this eternity of the cosmos itself is this, is these ultimately self-modifications and, you know, changing forms themselves, right? So is there an in, in innate meaning to it? I mean, I, it depends on what kind of meaning you are searching for here. But if the question is, once you have decided onto a specific form, does that change anything and everything in its reach, right? In its association, then the question, the, the answer is yes. If you have a circular shape, it is very different from a rectangular. And not on a very you know, cosmetic level, right? In the way that you experience the space, in the way it will force you to form, you know, a different mode of organization, in the way that it will require a different, you know, roof, let's say detailing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it will have different meanings with respect to how it presents itself, but it is neither fixed nor eternally true or correct, right? Uh, it depends on the way that it interacts with its environment and the way that we come to interact with that. So if I were you know, part of an exploration experimentation with the question of archetypes in architecture, I would try to understand archetypes as uh, from a topological perspective. That is to say, something that is constantly changing. How can you give form to something, right? That in its uh, ultimate, let's say, uh, ultimate horizon uh, wants to shape shift all the time. It doesn't mean you make something that shape shifts all the time. It means you're trying to give form to that. And how can you do that, right? So when Stephen also referred to the example of Mahalinaj, right? You can see that in his sculpture, he is trying to channel both animation, right? It is a kinetic sculpture, one of the first. Yet at the same time, it plays with light, right? And at the same time, it plays with uh, very basic Bauhaus figures, the circle, the square, as it research, and all their relationships, the, the modulator of light. So that is that is one way of uh, one way of. Uh, channeling those forces. Um, I hope you can, with your, with your obsession, 
with architects and I'm saying obsession in a positive way right, right now because an architect, if you're not obsessed, there's something wrong. You have to be obsessed with something, right? Uh, then I hope you can bring out something that is fresh and not looking for eternal truths, but something very dynamic and not static. Okay. Thank you. It's, uh, it's very thought thought provoking. Uh, if if I may, just uh, something else came to my mind was um, we we were, we're kind of posed with this question of the cosmos in this in this residency, and that's. It's quite profound and a bit um, the kind of a curveball for for architecture in a way because we're we're basically dismissing everything that that you, you kind of know as part of the architectural discourse in in certain ways. Um, but how, how can we how can we even think or conceive of the cosmos beyond architecture? Um, this is this is something that I, I've noticed. I mean, humans have always try to um, express, I mean, the idea of dimensions and how, how previous civilizations had, had built these forms simultaneously without communication that kind of represented one another. That's, that's one thing that, I mean, if you can even, even speak to that, that would be quite interesting. Uh, I mean, we only have a certain set of uh, Time that we can go as far as reaching back to. But for example, the Mesopotamians and the Mesoamericans and the ancient Egyptians were all concerned with this stepping, this kind of compression, this infinite compression of, of form. Of course, it's restricted by our physical capabilities, perhaps. But yeah, that's, it's, I don't know if that's in the form of a question, but uh, you can share your thoughts on, on that. And even the, possi the possibility, let's say, of of uh, of the non like without communication, these these things simultaneously happening. Is it? I don't know if it, is it a conversation of dimensions. Is it a, is it a conversation of like uh, observation of the of the universe around us and distilling certain principles from that? Is it just a human thing that that we're kind of extracting? Right. I mean, again, you are trying to take the conversation towards a path in which you want to affirm that there are these, I would almost say platonic ideals, right? There is the stepping or there is the shape of the, you know, uh, circle or the square and this and that, and they're all pure. And then certain different civilizations approach it from different angles. And because, you know, they have different, you know, climatic or secondary, let's say physical conditions, then they create different iterations of that. I would want you, if, if you're asking me this question, to go towards the opposite direction. Right. Try to try to acknowledge the diversity of everything that has existed from an architectural viewpoint up until now. I mean, there are of course incredible commonalities, right? Why not? Because you know, uh, certain uh, you know, um, the possibility space of our body, our you know, feet, our hands, the way we use our height, you know, uh, average uh, heights, etc., etc. They are they they give us certain affordances. This is a concept from again ecology. Affordances meaning in the environment, certain things give us the possibility to walk on. Certain things give us the possibility to be exposed to sun or not, right? If you, once you discover that if you go into a cave and you have this shading, then that gives you the understanding of, okay, I can you know, protect myself like this. Then you try to imitate that and create something from that. Yet it is not that because there are these pure ideals eternal ideas, you know, in, in heaven or what have you, and we take them from there and try to apply them onto matter, it doesn't work like that. But it is from all these incredible experimentations, right? Commonalities occur and commonalities and singularities, all these differences and their continuities, try not to choose a side, which is very difficult. Right. It is difficult to say, you know, everything flows and you know everything is one this homogeneous block in which we are all part of it. 
And it is very easy to say that everything is plurality, everything is different from each other. The most difficult philosophical part for architecture, but philosophy as well, to affirm the multiple and the one, the continuity and the singularity at the same time. How can you come up with a system of archetypes in which there are these commonalities that need to be acknowledged, right? In form, in you know, understanding of space, but also each and every mode of these applications are unique, singular, always you know, running towards a different dimension. Right? There are steady equilibriums, but then there are, uh, there are these far from equilibrium, let's say, moments uh, in which there's always a leap and all of a sudden we come face to face with a different form that hitherto not existed. Right? And that's the meaning of art and you know, architecture, if you think about it. Until Van Gogh, we had a lot of yellow paintings, right? But he discovered a different dimension in the yellow, right? And so when we look at his paintings, we see the yellow in a different lens. It is no longer the same yellow. It is yellow, right? He is using the same pigments almost, right? And it is you know, you can put it in an art historical context and talk about its continuities here and there, but there is such a unique gesture there that that yellow did not exist before him. He invents that tonality of yellow. Right? The architects are similar, every architect. You are trying to invent, you are trying to become part of this continuity and commonality of the architectural languages, all the historical traditions. It is meaningless to dismiss any of this. You are part of the canon, but at the same time, how can you show your singular gesture within that, right? Which will not be a part of the archetype. It can perhaps create its own archetype, but it is definitely not to be collapsed into a previous archetypical thinking, right? Does it help? Yeah, no, I really appreciate that the answer it, it makes it to be like a, a kind of lifelong thought experiment so, <laughs> That's great, beautiful answer thank you thank you so much Gokin um, and everyone just to be mindful of everyone's time um, it's hard to end this lecture since there's we can talk for hours um, it was amazing it was an amazing inspiring lecture today and it was fully a pleasure to have you and learning about these complex and fundamental concepts through your lens and storytelling thank you again uh, Logan my pleasure thank you very much um, thank you we'd like to see you at the final review of our students work and see if you could just give a few remarks in our final pin-up uh, it would be great. I would be very happy. But I'm in Istanbul now, so the time difference, I hope the time difference works for us. Okay, great. All right. Thank, well, thank you, you. Good man. All right. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, bye. I would also thank uh, Stephen, um, Dimitra, and panelists, everyone joining us today. Uh, just for your information, our next lecture titled as New Habits and New Habitats, The Search for a Viable Model by Ellen K. Levy, artist, will be tomorrow, July 12th at 11 a.m. New York time. Please see the link in the chat if you would like to register for this lecture and stay connected. These space doors are always open to visitors and we would love to have you over and show you the beautiful property T space is located at. Thank you again, everyone, and looking forward to seeing you all in our next lecture.